Good morning, everyone. I'm Karen McCorder, Scarlet Curator of Western American Art at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming. I'm so sorry not to be with you all this morning in person, but really appreciate the opportunity to present remotely, and I do hope to connect with many of you after today's proceedings. Just a quick thanks to the conference organizers and especially Claire Robinson for extending this invitation. So my talk today will introduce early research undertaken for a 2023 exhibition on the 19th century American artist Alfred Jacob Miller and his connections to Scotland through William Drummond Stewart. If I were with you in person, I'd ask how many among you are familiar with Alfred Jacob Miller? I'd hope to see quite a few enthusiastic hands pop up in the auditorium, but I wouldn't be too terribly surprised if some among you weren't as well acquainted with the artist, despite the fact that one of the most intriguing chapters of his story happens and took place not far from where you sit today, in Perthshire at Mirthley Castle. The exhibition we're developing will shed new light on Miller's time in the American West in 1837 and in Scotland from 1840 to 42. Principally, the exhibition will explore the transatlantic patronage relationship between Alfred Jacob Miller and William Drummond Stewart. We'll expand upon seminal earlier studies and incorporate new findings and perspectives. Our exhibition will be the most focused examination of the artist in more than a decade and will be the first to bring together, study, and celebrate what we affectionately call the Mirthly Castle Millers. We feel strongly that close analysis of these special painting subjects and style, careful consideration of the terms of their commission and their original intended context can yield much. We hope to add significantly to scholarship around Miller the artist, Stuart the patron, and the Erzots American West they together created in Scotland in the 19th century. So I'd like to begin by briefly discussing this compelling tale's two main protagonists, William Drummond Stewart. Stewart was born at Mirthley in 1795 and grew up there and at the Grand Tully and Strathbron estates. The eldest Stewart son, John, was to succeed to the family's titles, property, and estates revenues. This was the cause of much contention between the brothers. At the age of 17, William's father purchased for him a cornetcy in the 6th Dragoon Guards. He subsequently became lieutenant and later captain. He retired from military service in 1821. Stuart was a larger-than-life figure, a smartly dressed, creative, and often dramatic character. But he was far from feckless. He was well-educated, worldly, meticulous, and entrepreneurial. He attended social functions in London and in Edinburgh and traveled throughout Italy, the Balkans, and West Asia, often hunting on these excursions. Stuart had a son, George, out of wedlock, but soon married the child's mother. Stuart and his wife Christina led very separate lives. Christina raised George while Stuart lived quite itinerantly, seeking adventure and entertainment. Newer biographical studies of Stuart especially William Benjamin's Men in Eden, suggests that he was likely homosexual and that his desire to travel to the American West may have been inspired in part by the freedom of self-expression that the region promised, a sense of freedom that was heightened by distance from his aristocratic life and family in Scotland. In 1833, at the age of 37, Stuart headed to the American West for the very first time, setting off from St. Louis, Missouri. He traveled with a fur trading caravan. He paid his way and essentially was just along for the ride, for the experience. By 1837, he had traveled west five times, spending the summer into fall seasons each year on the trail. The highlight of these trips was certainly the annual Fur Traders and Trappers Rendezvous, a three-week-long event with roots in the 1820s at which some business and mostly carousing took place. 1837 is a critical year in our story for several reasons. Stuart thought this might be his last trip west. The fur trade was on the decline, spelling obsolescence for his beloved rendezvous, and family duties back in Scotland called. To memorialize this trip, then, he hired an artist to accompany him, 
that's Miller, and diligently collected Western artifacts, principally Indian-made objects in samples of flora and fauna. As fate would have it, the 1837 trip wasn't to be Stewart's last. He ventured to the Rockies in 1838 and continued to add to his Western collection, gathering, quote, redbirds, gourds, two live buffaloes, and a grizzly bear, more Indian artifacts, and plants and seeds. Upon his return from the Rockies that year, Stuart learned that he'd inherited the family's estate. He adopted the title Sir and became the Baronet. In 1839, after seven years' travel in America, Stuart returned to Perthshire with Antoine Clement, his French-Canadian Cree Indian companion in tow. Stuart would go back to the West once more in the 1840s, but by and large his wild Western adventure was over. He'd accepted the duty of managing his family's estate, a duty that required regular presence at Mirthley. His interest in the American West, however, would not wane. He would write two fictionalized autobiographies based on his Western experience, Altawan and Edward Warren, and, as we'll see, he would create what I'm describing as an ersatz American West in Perthshire. Stuart died in 1871. His son George predeceased him, and though Stuart's younger brother would become the new laird, Sir William left all of his movable property at Mirthley to an adopted son, Frank Nichols of Texas. Among the movable property was a large group of Western paintings by Miller and all of Stuart's travel memorabilia. Frank sold many of the paintings to Stuart's neighbors and then auctioned off the remainder in Stuart's other possessions in Edinburgh shortly following Stuart's death. On to Miller. Miller was born in 1810 in Baltimore, Maryland. He showed an early aptitude for art and as a young man studied with the British-born American portrait painter Thomas Sully. And as was customary of budding American artists at this time, Miller undertook a grand tour of Europe in his 20s, studying primarily in France and in Italy. Miller enrolled at the leading art schools, made copies after old masters, and befriended artists and contemporaries active in the Romantic movement. In late 1834, he returned to Baltimore and two years later established a studio in New Orleans, from which he primarily sold society portraits. It was there in New Orleans in April of 1837 that Stuart visited Miller's studio and offered him his first major commission. Stuart invited Miller to accompany him to the rendezvous. Miller, aged 27 at the time, said yes. He said yes to an adventure that would indelibly change the course of his career. So Miller traveled with Stuart to a predetermined site in the Green River Valley in what was then called Oregon Country, now my home state of Wyoming. On the trail and while in camp, Miller made quick sketches in pencil and pen and ink, sometimes including ink and watercolor washes, and working in a variety of paper types and sizes. His subjects were primarily native peoples they met and with whom they traveled, interesting geological fe features and formations, Anglo forts, landscapes, hunt scenes, and animal encounters, and the antics of Stuart and his men. When the party reached the rendezvous, Miller interpreted the event's dizzying, exciting details. He also captured some of Stuart's hunting and fishing escapades in the surrounding Wind River Mountains following the rendezvous. It's impossible to overstate the singularity and importance of Miller's Western adventure. He was the first American artist to travel into the heart of the Rocky Mountains and the only artist to depict the fur trade during its heyday. Miller returned to New Orleans in October of 1837 to fulfill Stuart's commission. Living and working between New Orleans and Baltimore, he would transform the drawings and quick paintings he'd made on the trail into more polished watercolors and oil paintings. In the summer of 1839, Miller had his first major exhibition of Western work at the Apollo Gallery in New York. The exhibition was comprised of 18 oil paintings and was so popular that the gallery requested an extension for a total of a seven week run. Miller subsequently exhibited at Apollo for a second time, showing his grandest Western painting yet, Cavalcade or Indian Grand Parade, measuring 168 by 244 centimeters. 
After the Apollo shows, Miller's artwork was sent on to Mirthly Castle. Miller followed his artwork to Scotland in 1840 to work on additional oil paintings for Stuart's estate. He arrived in late summer, and by October, he'd already finished two canvases. He was treated as a, quote, honored guest and given a, quote, spacious, well-lighted studio in which to work. He described it as, quote, a delicious little painting room, which looks out upon the garden. Miller spent the next year working at Mirthley. In letters to his family, the artist provides what's probably the best record of the castle and what life was like there during Stuart's tenure as Laird. He described the carefully kept grounds and opulent interior spaces. He relayed his experiences, like sharing multi-course dinners with aristocratic guests and lounging fireside in the castle's library. He also mentioned visits to neighboring estates, like that of the Bridalbans, for whom he painted commissioned portraits. In November of 1841, Miller transitioned to a studio in London where he worked on religious paintings for Mirthley's Chapel. He left for Baltimore in the spring of 1842, rounding out nearly two years abroad. Back in his native city, Miller returned to portrait painting and accepted commissions for landscapes and copies of famous paintings, but would continue to paint Western scenes for the rest of his career, drawing on his experience, sketches, memories, imagination, and sometimes dipping into popular literature, increasingly so, for inspiration. Miller enjoyed several major commissions for watercolor replicas of earlier Western works, including 200 from William T. Walters of Baltimore and 40 more from Alexander Hargreaves Brown of Liverpool, England. The total body of Miller's Western work numbers nearly 1,000, with more than 700 of those housed in institutional collections. And I have to make a quick shameless plug for Fur Traders and Rendezvous, the Alfred Jacob Miller online catalog those institutionally held Millers with Western subjects that I mentioned, they're cataloged here online at alfredjacobmiller.com, a free searchable web resource that the Center of the West created in partnership with the Ricketts Art Foundation and the Museum of the Mountain Man. I'd encourage you all to check it out. So let's weave Stewart's and Miller's stories more tightly together and head back to Persher so as to consider this Erzat's American West that Stuart so thoughtfully created in Scotland, a project to which Miller's artwork was central. I've referenced Miller's Western paintings made for Stuart, but let's itemize them. There were 87 watercolors, what Miller called sketches. Most of these, if not all, were made before Miller went to Scotland, and they represent the first set of duplicates of Miller's on-the-spot trail sketches. The center of the West has nine of these, six of which are shown here. As you can see, the sketches are rendered in mostly monochromatic palettes in pencil, pen and ink, washes, and sometimes watercolor. Interestingly, Miller was inconsistent in his use of paper types and colors. They're generally numbered and titled in Miller's hand. Then there were the 19 Apollo Gallery paintings. Those are the large oils. Miller produced these, these 19 paintings, and the 87 watercolors in approximately 18 months, a monumental feat. When we look at them more closely, those formalists among you might find some technical shortcomings to critique, and I won't blame you for so doing. Often passages are marked by technical shortcomings, slight awkwardness, anatomical distortions, but in addition to that almost unbelievable pace at which Miller painted, Let's recall, too, that he was a young artist at the outset of his career. Ron Tyler has pointed out that Miller truly had little experience in producing such large paintings. Here's another pair from the Apollo show. And note in each of these cases the dimensions. They are quite large. Miller made 10 or more additional Western paintings during his 1840 to 42 tenure in Scotland and England. He also created those religious works I referenced from Earthly's Chapel. And finally, according to a friend of the artists writing about him posthumously, Miller, quote, reportedly painted a picture of Indian life every year and sent it to Stuart. I'm working to find any corroborating evidence to support this claim. That could add nearly 29 more Western pictures made in Scotland, made for Scotland, rather. Looking at this body of work as a whole, we notice that regarding the subjects of Mirthly Castle paintings, native peoples are a major focus. 
and Stuart himself is featured prominently. It makes sense as these paintings were meant to tell of his experience in the American West. Lisa Strong says that more than half of the watercolor sketches include Stuart. Ron Tyler quotes approximately two thirds. Stuart is easily recognizable in these paintings with his conspicuous hooked nose, flat brimmed hat, and a tailored buckskin suit, a kind of hybrid form of Euro-American frontier attire with its origins in American Indian dress. Antoine Clement is shown in over a third of Miller's sketches and is often included in major oil paintings like this one. Stuart played a principal role in the selection of subjects in their depiction. Correspondence from Miller suggests that Stuart visited the artist's painting room regularly to check in on his progress and offer constructive critiques. So how are these works installed? Well, according to Miller, his oil paintings sent from America were meant to be suspended in Murthley's library, and the sketches were destined to be bound in a portfolio. According to Lisa Strong, the oil paintings were, quote, dispersed throughout the castle, in the drawing room, the library, and Stuart's bedroom. For much of Stuart's life at Murthley, he kept his bedroom at Dalpoe Lodge, a now demolished structure which once stood at the western edge of the estate, proximate to a herd of bison he kept in a nearby park. At Del Poe, the paintings hung from brass rods along the ceiling. Miller's paintings were only part of Del Poe's decorative, decorative scheme, though. I mentioned earlier that Stuart collected travel souvenirs from his Western adventures. He also had his American-based friends continue to ship him items once he'd returned to Scotland. Let me set the scene at Del Poe for you. Imagine a space filled with plant specimen, stuffed birds, Indian weapons, tools, and clothing, mounted heads of bighorn and bison, and skins of bear, bison, and cougar on the floor. Interestingly, Stuart displayed few trapper-related collectibles, intentionally using Native American objects primarily to represent the American West that he knew and loved. These Native American objects were also used as props for Miller's paintings, complemented by the collection the artist himself brought over for inspiration. A slight sidebar, I must note that Stuart's Western collections were mixed with Eastern travel souvenirs, and that Stuart's, quote, passion for Orientalia also influenced his residence's interior design. He decorated his home with Persian rugs and jewel-toned tapestries. Turkish lamps cast patterned shadows across the space, and instead of sleeping in a bed, Stuart is known to have slept on a divan. Interestingly, he brought some among his Eastern collections to the American West as well. So Stuart not only created an ersatz far west in Scotland, he also created an ersatz far east in the American West. He toted luxurious rugs to spread beneath and around his large striped tent, upon which he regaled his comrades with stories of his travels to Europe and Asia. Back to Dalpoe, beyond the walls and throughout Murthley's grounds, Stuart planted trees and smaller spe species from America, mostly derived from the Rocky Mountain region. These were species like Western Hemlock and Lawson Cypress, Sitka Spruce and Douglas Fir, also Rhododendrons, Azalea, Buffalo Grass, and the edible Tobacco Root. He also installed Western American animal species throughout the estate. You'll recall, you'll recall that he shipped several bison and a bear to Murthley in 1838. He also paid for the passage of two Native American gamekeepers to look after his Western stock. And the year before, he'd sent live bison calves to his friend Lord Bridalbin at Tamith Castle and later had additional bulls and calves and cows shipped over. Apparently, he continued to exchange animals with his friends in America for years after he returned to Scotland. Cattle, horses, deer, bison, and birds, all of these made transatlantic trips. So ultimately, at Stuart's creative and often flamboyant direction, both the interior and exterior of his country manor evoked the Western American wilds, and to a lesser extent, the exotic East, Stuart's love for these places, both their physical realities and their auras, commingled in a space that was once eclectic, artful, artificial, and extravagant. Stuart's transfigured mirthly speaks poignantly to his pursuit of self-description. 
taken together, Miller's artwork and Stewart's collection of artifacts, flora, and fauna helped memorialize great adventures and paint a very particular portrait of a man. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. If you're interested in learning more about our project, please do contact me. My information is on the screen here. As we further develop this show, I'll be continuing to work toward identifying the current locations of as many Mirthly Castle Millers as possible and studying these paintings ever more closely. Many we know are in American collections, but the location of others of more than a handful are still unknown. I'm sincerely hoping that some are in British collections and that this fine group, you all, or its network might help bring several to light. Thank you so much.